47, the 47th Psalm. And just uh, because I think it's important to be true to the context of Scripture and be good students of the Bible, uh, and because I'm a pastor and I'm a teacher by nature, uh, psalms, the word psalm literally means song. And so it is not the proper thing to ever say psalm chapter 47 because they're not chapters, they're songs. Or if you get to the book of Proverbs, Proverb 3, a wise writing, the third wise writing. Now that is just for what that's worth. I'm not going to be the Bible police, and if someone gets up behind this pulpit and says, turn to Psalms chapter 100, don't look at me. I won't shout them down and pull them down off the platform. But I think it's good that we, when we have opportunity, just uh, share, you know, the correct way to understand the scripture. And I'm so happy that you're here. I hope that the Lord will help us through his word today. Amen. Psalm 47, and we will, at the close of our service, be taking communion together, and I'm excited, looking forward to that. Psalm 47 and verse number 1. O clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. Everyone in the house, would you say, clap your hands? And then would you say, voice of triumph? Voice of triumph. Verse 2. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. He will subdue the peoples under us and the nation under our feet. He will choose our inheritance for us, the excellence of Jacob whom he loves, Selah. Now there is that word Selah, S-E-L-A-H, and that just simply, when you read that in the book of Psalms, simply what that means is to stop and to ponder and consider what you've just read. And so it's good to do that. You know, the, the Bible talks about meditating on the word of the Lord and meditating in the night watch or meditating up on your bed. Uh, it, it's good to allow the word of God to get in our spirit and to marinate in our spirit. But it is from that first verse of Psalm 47 that I will uh, take my subject matter today where the scripture says, shout to God with the voice of triumph. One more time, say the voice of triumph. Voice of triumph. I wanna preach uh, for just a few minutes on voices. Everyone say voices. voices. Now here's what I have found in several years of serving the Lord. It is rather easy to clap our hands unless you're like my friend Darren Sargent who only has one hand and then it's not too easy to clap your hands. And I say that and you think, oh my goodness, he would hate to hear that. No, he's the one that makes fun of that. We'll be in services together and the service leader will say, clap your hands, everybody. And he'll say, that is so prejudiced. And I hope sometimes he's on the West Coast. Darren, I hope you're watching this webcast right now because he got a shout out at New Life today. Uh, but it is very easy, uh, respectively, to clap our hands. In fact, it is a relatively low risk praise. I didn't say it's not a powerful praise, but it's a low risk praise. So let's, let's prove this. Ready? Let's all clap our hands. Very good. Very good. Did that feel good? Okay. Some of you clap loud. Some of you clap soft. Some of you clap fast. Some of you clap slow. Some of you clap with open hands. Some of you clap with closed hands. But clapping is a praise that is mentioned in Scripture. It is also, by all intents and purposes, a low-risk praise. And there's a reason why. Because we do that for things other than worship in church. Your team scores a basket. You clap. You listen to that concert band and they do great and you clap your child does something on the stage 
It could be tripping over their own feet. But as a parent, we clap. For years, I used to preach a lot of youth camps, and youth camps are one of the most clap-happy places I've ever been to. You don't have to say much at all, and teenagers will just clap. But it is entirely different when we engage our voice especially in a voice of triumph. Here's what the wise psalmist said. Oh, clap your hands, all ye peoples. In other words, everybody clap your hands. But then he kind of ratcheted it up a little bit out of the safety zone of low risk praise when he said, shout to God with the voice of triumph. Now, The reason why I want to kind of park here for just a few moments is because it is very easy to lift up our voice in need, is it not? It's one thing to clap our hands to the Lord and then lift up our voice and say, God, help me. That's not the voice of triumph. That's the voice of need. And surely we need to have the voice of need. In fact, the Bible says, make your requests known before God. And he'll hear us. He'll hear the cry of the righteous. And yet, there's something even more powerful than the voice of need, and that is the voice of triumph. The voice that says, I haven't seen victory happen yet, but I'm willing to risk it by voicing what I see coming. I'm willing to step beyond what seems logical in the moment. And I'm going to give voice not to my reality, but I'm going to give voice to my faith. I'm not going to just say what I'm going through right now, but I'm going to say my kids are saved and my family is whole. And my marriage is strong. And my body is healed. And my church is full. And the word is powerful. I'm going to lift up my voice. Everybody say my voice. And I'm going to let it out in a voice of victory. And a voice of triumph. Now, it is my belief that within the context of any of our lives... There are multiple voices that are speaking to us. And then there are multiple ways we give voice to our own thoughts. The first one is the voice of doubting. Everybody say the voice of doubting. The introduction of this voice of doubt comes quickly in the scripture. You get to about page two of your Bible and we are introduced to the voice of doubting. Adam and Eve have been created in the image of God and the serpent, Lucifer, the embodiment of the devil himself, comes to Eve and says this, has God really said that you shouldn't eat of that fruit of that tree? And Eve begins a conversation with the devil. Well, the Lord said, yes, we can't eat of the fruit. We can't even touch the fruit because in the day that we partake of that fruit, we will surely Die And the serpent, the devil, begins to try to sow and to cast doubt upon the word of God. You shall not surely die. In fact, when you eat of that fruit, you'll be wise like God. You'll become like God. And I want you to notice the first threat that the enemy brings against mankind is the introduction of doubt to the word of God. Of God. This is why we have to identify this in our lives very quickly. Anything that causes us to begin to doubt what God's word says. I want to preach it clear today. I want to get my life fixed on a simple understanding of God's word. That if God said it, God can do it. If God declared it, God can still do it. If God ever healed one body, he can still heal a body today. 
If he can set a demoniac free from the devil, he can still set people free today. I want to get to the place where doubt does not occupy my mind. Because it's a very, very sure thing. The enemy will come and try to sow doubt in our lives. To be doubtful is to be uncertain about, to consider questionably or highly unlikely, to hesitate to believe. Peter is on a housetop in Acts chapter number 10, and the Lord gives him a powerful vision of a sheet coming down. And on this sheet, as portrayed in Acts 10, are all sorts of beasts, both clean to the Jewish faith and unclean to the Jewish faith. And when the sheet comes down, Peter notices that not just once it visits him, but three times it visits him. And, and, and when, the, when the vision goes away the third time, there's a knock at the door. And he inquires as to who is downstairs. And they come and tell him there are men from the house of one named Cornelius. And they are here. Cornelius was a Gentile. He wasn't under Hebrew covenant. And they're here and they want you to come and preach the gospel to them. And the Bible says that Peter rose up after seeing this vision of unclean animals and the Lord saying, rise, kill, and eat. In other words, partake of something that is considered unclean. Peter rose up and the Bible says he went with them, nothing doubting. Because if Peter is ever going to step into that next realm of revival, he's got to conquer the enemy of doubt first. If Peter is ever going to push past the way it's always happened, he's going to have to push past doubt. If Simon Peter is ever going to become the great man of God that opens up salvation to every Gentile, every non-Jew, he's going to have to come against doubt. So let me say it here clearly. If we, and I believe we are on a journey to great revival, but if we're ever going to get where God wants to take us, we're going to have to do war against the spirit of doubt. If we're ever going to see the great blessed promised land that God has for us, we're going to have to square our shoulders back and say, Lord, it doesn't matter how long it takes. It doesn't matter who goes or who doesn't go. I'm in this thing with you. I am conquering the spirit and the attitude of doubt. I love being around people that are full of faith because people full of faith are exactly that, they're full of faith. And I will tell you, people that are full of faith sometimes can be mocked because of how quick they, they give voice to their faith. I never will forget years ago when Brother Billy Cole, who was a great prophet of the Lord, and he, he began to take trips over to Ethiopia and Africa and uh, would see marvelous things happen. I remember one particular crusade that I heard of I had many friends that went on these trips to Africa with him, and I remember hearing reports of 100,000 people in one service receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let me just back up and say that one more time. 100,000 people in one service receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I watched video clips of this crusade, and as far as... As you could see, in every direction, there was a sea of humanity. And the Holy Ghost began to fall in that place. And there were people positioned strategically throughout that entire crusade grounds. It, it was such a, a large gathering, one area could not hold them. They were just everywhere. And the reports started coming back to North America. 100,000 people filled with the Holy Ghost. In one service. Now, what I'm fixing to tell you may startle you, but there were some preachers that refused to believe that. Let it that, that kind of marinate on you for a while. I'm not talking about unbelievers. There were preachers. Men and women of God who would stand up and declare God is going to do great things in the last days. 
who said that could never happen. There could never be 100,000 people receive the Holy Ghost in one service. Now, the point of this story is not to compare myself with any other preacher. But Sam, I never had a problem with that. And again, this is a risk I take because I'm not trying to just draw comparisons here. But when I heard that, my first thought, Joe, was praise God. That's 100,000 more people born into the kingdom of God. Praise God. And let me tell you why I believe it so quickly. And here's the thing. People full of faith are people that many times get mocked because they're quick to agree with something. The reason why I am so passionate about that, the reason why I say absolutely that happened in Ethiopia is because I want God to know whatever he wants to do. If it goes way beyond what I can ever contain. Listen, I want to I just say it right now. If God wants to do something at this church that goes beyond this room that we sit in right now, I don't want my unbelief and my doubt to somehow hold that captive. I want Chopata I want to believe God for anything and everything. I want to believe him for anything being possible. I need some people to help me preach right now. Woo. Come on, I don't need people to just agree with pastor. I need you to agree with the Lord right now. This is the hour for God's church. This is the day of revival. This is our time. This is our moment. This is our moment of time. Praise God. Brother Hardin said something to me years ago. He said, Brother Gaddy, I see the day that 100 people are going to be water baptized in one year at New Life Church. So, Brother Hardin, I say it again. I believe it. 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 We're going to keep on teaching Bible studies. We're going to keep on trusting. We're going to keep on baptizing people. There is nothing too hard for God. We're going to have to do war against the voice of doubt. Peter rose nothing doubting. See, people that struggle with doubt say, that sermon can't be for me. I'm too far gone. I've started. I've stopped too many times in living for God. That's why Paul said to the, the men present in 1 Timothy chapter number 2, I would that men lift up holy hands without doubt. Because there are some things about God that cannot be reasoned in rational terms. So we have to park our insecurities and fight against the spirit of doubt. Everybody say, identify it and shut it down. Amen. I'm not just talking about the voice of doubt that we hear, but the voice of doubt that we speak. Look at somebody and say, that's not almost right. That is right. Uh, the voice of doubt. There's another voice very powerful in Scripture, and that's the voice of wonder. Luke chapter 24 and verse number 12. It has been noised abroad that something has happened at the tomb. And Luke 24 and 5 says, they were afraid and they bowed down their faces to the earth and they said unto them, Luke 24 and verse 5, why seek ye the living among the dead? I want you to see this. How many of you have your Bible? Hold your Bible up if you got this. If you don't, I want you to see that. If you, if you do, look at it. If you don't, we'll put it on the screen. Luke 24 and 6. Here's what the angel said. He is not here, but risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. Look at the tenth verse. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. What is that? That's doubt creeping in. 
Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher. And stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, watch what the word says, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Now, I want you to see the conflict here. On one hand, all of the other apostles are saying, that's an idle tale. You really spent too much time last night not sleeping. But you've been drinking. You sure you're okay? Because what you are proposing that Jesus is alive, that's just an idle tale. I saw him die on that cross. I watched them take him down and put him in that tomb. That's just an idle tale. And yet Simon Peter while everybody else is hearing the voice of doubt and speaking the voice of doubt, Simon Peter begins to wonder, hmm. By the way, this is gold right here. You ready? This is gold. I don't know how you're going to write this if you're taking notes, but every great altar experience starts with, hmm. I don't even know how you transpose that. But every great breakthrough starts with, I wonder, what would happen if I did something today that I've never done before? Oh, let me preach to some people who've had a walk with God for a while. I wonder what would happen if I would respond to God in a way that I used to respond to him in. I've grown a little cold. I've grown a little indifferent. I wonder what would happen if I prayed again. I wonder what would happen if I'd step into that place again. I wonder what would happen if I would lift up my hand one more time and petition heaven. I wonder what would happen. Oh, that God would help us to hear the voice of wonder and begin to speak. I wonder what God would do if we would just push past doubt and begin to wonder about the goodness of the Lord among his people. I wonder what would happen if God would shake Cabot, Arkansas with a revival that goes beyond what we've ever experienced before. I wonder what would happen if people would pray like we've never prayed before, consecrate like we've never consecrated before. I wonder what would happen if we'd push in a little harder. I wonder what would happen in my family if I would spend a little more time in devotion. I wonder what would happen if I'd worship with reckless abandon. I wonder what would happen if I wouldn't worry about who's around me and I would just get shut in with Jesus and let him touch my life on this Sunday morning. I wonder if there would be anybody that would run to the tomb and say it sounds crazy, but just maybe he's alive. Maybe, maybe it's true. It sounds preposterous. It sounds like it couldn't be true, but maybe it is true. Maybe there's a scrap of truth in that. Maybe that, 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 that angel wasn't lying. Maybe there is a truth embedded in what seems to be chaos and tragedy in my life. Could it be? Wonder what would happen if. I wonder what this means to me. Praise God. It's the voice of wonder. Not just that we hear that voice, but we speak that voice. You, you've, some of you have heard me preach on this before. One of my favorite passages in the New Testament is the book of Mark chapter 2, where four men bring one of their buddies who's paralyzed to a house where Jesus is. And the Bible says in this gospel account that they cannot get in the house because it's so packed. It's like a preacher's dream. Totally full. Can't get another person in the house. Literally can't get another person in the house. 
Now, to a great percentage of people, that is a, excuse the cliche, closed door. Wait till next time. Hopefully the revival is going to be a few nights. Maybe Jesus will stay for a while. But to someone that is listening for the voice of wonder and someone who's willing to speak the voice of wonder, a full house is not the end of the story. You you may have heard me say this before. In any group of four, there's usually one that's just a little bit off. So look down the row right now. You decide. See, in any group of four, there's three that think logically. But there's one that wonders. Hmm. I wonder what would happen if we'd break a few rules. Hey, this isn't even our house. I know it's not our house. I'm not worried about that right now. It's better to ask forgiveness. You ever met anybody like that? It's better to ask forgiveness than permission. I don't see in the Bible, Josh, where the the guy that's just a little bit off knocked on the door and said, with your permission, we'd like to climb up the side of your house. And then with your permission, we'd like to rip the roof apart. Would that be okay with you? See, here's the thing. Oh, I feel dangerous right now. There are too many, too many born-again, Holy Ghost-filled people far too intimidated by the enemy. I'm just going to sit here, and hopefully the spiritual lottery will catch up with me one day. My number will come up, my name will be called, and I'll get a breakthrough for my family. Come on, Jesus. Every Tuesday and Saturday at 9.59, the balls are mixed up in the hopper. Some of you are really troubled right now. If you don't believe that, go down to this gas station and look at the poster on the wall. But it's so easy to get intimidated. I'm just going to wait. I'm going to bide my time. I'm going to bite my tongue. But for someone who's desperate, wonder takes charge. I wonder what would happen if we would kind of bend the rules here for just a moment. I wonder what would happen if we decide to climb up on this shutter right here and try to invent something. See, here's the thing. It's so easy to get intimidated because it's not protocol. It's not process. And it's not working from 9 to 1030 on Sunday morning. If it doesn't work in that 90 minutes, I just got to kind of grin and bear it the rest of the week. Could it be that during that 90 minutes, God wants to put something in our spirit that puts some backbone in us rather than a wishbone inside of us and rise up in our spirit and say, if it means I got to climb up on the house, I'm going to climb up on the house. If it means I got to rip the ceiling apart, I'm going to rip the ceiling apart. I wonder what would happen. Come on, I feel something moving in this house. I wonder what would happen for my mama if I prayed like I've never prayed before. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. It's a voice of wonder that we hear and it's a voice of wonder that we speak. And I believe, I believe, I believe this strongly. The thing that separates most people when it comes to breakthroughs in the kingdom of God. Now, I believe in the sovereignty of God. No no question here. But I think there's something about taking something and pressing in. Pressing in. Let me quickly come to a close. We talk about a voice of doubt, we hear it, we speak it. We talk about a voice of wonder, we hear it, we speak it. But there also is the voice of faith. This is the voice of triumph. 
that the sons of Korah spoke about in Psalm 47. This voice, hear me. In fact, if you've been sleeping so far, good morning. <laughs> Listen. The voice of faith does not wait for the perfect time. It rather states a belief. Not proof. A belief. The voice of faith is a shameless declaration that starts with our mouth. And it is a declaration of my association and my following of Jesus Christ. I begin to speak faith. And God honors faith. God backs up. Oh, God. He backs up faith. I wish there was a way that I could preach this like I need to preach it today. Listen to me, Mom. God's not waiting for it to get better for you to speak it. He wants you to declare it, and he'll back up that faith. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He's not waiting for your marriage to get better. He's looking for someone to say, I believe that God is in control, and I believe he's working on my wife. He's working on my husband. I'm speaking faith. I'm speaking it. I'm speaking it in my home. I'm speaking it in my church. I'm speaking it to my friends. I'm speaking it to my brothers and sisters. I'm speaking faith. Mary, the mother of Jesus, the womb from her womb came the Christ child. When the angel showed up to her and said, you're highly favored, Mary. You're going to have a child. He's going to save his people from their sins. You can see this. I'm not making this up. She said this, be it unto me according to your word. And I believe at that moment, the Holy Ghost overshadowed her because God was looking for somebody that would give voice to their faith. It was the leper that said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He didn't have proof of the cleansing yet. He didn't have one sore dried up yet. He didn't have one miracle yet. He simply said, God, you can do it. If you're willing, you can do it. And the Bible says that Jesus put out his hand and he touched him and said, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Come on, somebody. It's Matthew chapter 8 where the centurion said, Lord, just speak the word. And if you'll speak the word, my servant will be healed. He spoke the word and immediately that declaration of faith brought about a miracle. I'm talking about the voice of faith. The voice of faith. Speak the voice of faith. Speak it over your life. Speak it over your family. Two blind men came to Jesus. Matthew chapter 9, and Jesus asks them a simple question. Ready? I'm just about done. Listen, Matthew 9. <laughs> he said, do you believe that I am able to do this? You know what they said? Now, everybody, buckle your seatbelt. This is deep. Here, here was their reply. When Jesus said to the blind men, you believe I'm able to do this? Here's what they said. Yes, Lord. Period. <laughs> John, you and I are going to have revival. I know you're, you're tracking with me today. I may just come over here and uh, John and I will preach together today. See, we've made this way too complex. Jesus, the great Messiah, the miracle worker, the one incarnate in flesh, is standing here today. And he's simply saying, Tammy, do you believe that I'm able to do this? 
And I would to God there'd be people in this house that wouldn't get into an explanation mode. Well, yeah, yeah, well, God, you see, you'd have to do this and you'd have. I wish there'd be some people in here that would get an affirmative spirit that would say, oh, yes, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Joe, do you believe he, God is able to touch your sister? Oh, yes, Lord. Tim Gaddy, do you believe God's able to reclaim your sister? Oh, yes, God. Brother Isaiah, do you believe God is able to heal to the uttermost? Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, it's the voice of faith. I feel an unction from the Lord. Is God able to heal your prodigal children? Yes, Lord. Is God able to restore? Yes, Lord. Is God able to baptize? Yes, Lord. They spoke the voice of faith. Come on, if you got an unsaved prodigal loved one, I wish you would say, yes, Lord. I wish you would lift up your voice right now and say, God, I believe you are able. If you're asking me, are you able? You're able, God. Yeah. Come on, somebody, give voice to your faith. Give voice to your faith. Give voice to your faith. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Sister Celinda, I believe God has given you an awesome testimony, but there's coming a dimension of anointing upon your ministry that you've never experienced before. Is God able to do that? Yes, God's able to do that. Brother Jimmy, Sister Miranda, God's blessed celebrate recovery up to this point. Is God able to blow the top off of it? Yes, he's able to do that. Yes, he's able to minister. Yes, he's able to touch. See, this is why gossip is so destructive in a church. Don't worry, I'm still anointed. It's why gossip is so destructive, because it distracts our voice. It gets us judging one another. Did you see her? Did you see what they posted on Facebook? Woo, honey. Hey, girlfriend. Listen, listen. I'm anointed, right? Hush your mouth. Zip it. Don't give voice to that. You know what? Let's do this. Let's pray for them. And by the way, if you open up my head right now, there is nobody in my mind. I'm just going with what I feel in the Holy Ghost right now. We've got to shut the voice of gossip and open the mouth of faith. We've got to open. Listen, God will work on them if we'll pray for them. But absolutely lift your voice in faith and say, this is my day. God, you are able. God, you are powerful enough. I want us to pray right now. Everybody stand with me. I want us to pray that God will give us one voice. And that's the voice of faith. Come on, I don't even want to script this right now. I don't even believe in doing that. I, I wish somebody would just pray out loud to your God right now. I wish somebody would pray what you feel in your spirit right now. Woo! Come on, there's something stirring right now. There's something stirring in the Holy Ghost right now. There are some people, it's been a while since God touched you. It's been a while since you let God touch you. Go ahead and activate your voice. Go ahead and speak the voice of faith. Hallelujah. Come on, that's it. Go ahead, ladies. Lead the way right now. Lead the way. I'm not going to let my voice be silenced. I'm not going to let the enemy sow doubt in my spirit. I'm going to let wonder loose. I'm going to let faith loose. I'm going to speak it. 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 I'm going to declare it with my mouth. 
Come on, if you need something miraculous from God, you don't have to come to the front, but I wish you'd just do something. I wish you'd step out in the aisle or move a little bit and just lift up your voice to the Lord and say, God, you can. God, you can. God, you can. God, you're able. God, you're able to do what I can.